All right. Okay, let's pick it back up. Let's continue lesson five now and uh, part three, the Christian standing in Christ. And uh, when we talk about your standing, that's something that's fixed. That's something done. It's completed. It's finished. It cannot change. And your standing is not determined by you. Your standing is determined by God. When you received Jesus Christ, God foreordained. God predetermined that certain things were going to take place to you and in you and for you um, as a Christian. Look in Romans chapter 8. We'll start there. Romans chapter 8. And the first thing that gets fixed now when you get saved is there's uh, no condemnation. No condemnation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in. Now, look at that word. And what you need to do is as we're doing these studies, and you read your Bible and you look in that New Testament, how many times that term comes up? That's the issue. Are you in Christ Jesus? See? I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm in Christ. That's, that's what makes the difference. That's, my standing is in Christ. And in Christ, there's no condemnation. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What? In the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, I'm no longer in the flesh, I'm in the Spirit. See? Uh, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. When you're in Christ and Christ is in you, the righteousness of the law is being fulfilled in you. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The us is who? Us. Which means those that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit is who? Us. Now, what messes people up is there's other places in the Bible where it talks about walking after the flesh and walking after the Spirit having to do with your state. But this ain't talking about your state. This is talking about your standing in Christ. Look at verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal minded is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Now, aren't you in the flesh? No, you're not. See, in the eyes of God, he's, he's, what He looks at is that new man that's not in the flesh, that's in the Spirit. And that's what He's talking about back up there in verse 1. That's why there's no condemnation. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Uh, whatever you do in the flesh, as far as your standing goes, God doesn't see it. It's dead to Him. Do you understand that? It's, it's just, it's nothing. It's, it's say, say somebody gets saved and they live the whole rest of their life in the flesh and don't do anything for God. You know what they've done in their life? Nothing. nothing. It's void. It's vain. It's a blank. And there's going to be Christians standing before Jesus Christ and that's going to be their testimony. And that's going to be their life. A blank. A waste. Nothing to show for it at all. Just a blank. Verse 10, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Is God going to look upon sin? No. Is He going to look upon your body in that sense? No. What's He looking upon? The Spirit, the new man. The new man that's in there, see? Uh, that's your, you have no condemnation. Uh, some of you, I'm saying that, and you're kind of like, oh, darn I don't understand that. First Thessalonians. First 
1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. No condemnation. For yourselves, brethren, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 10, uh, and wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. All right, I have no idea why I read that verse. You think? You want to try it? Nah, that don't that don't work either. Well, I don't know. There's probably a good verse there somewhere. But I have no idea where it is. Alright. Anyway, there's no condemnation now. No condemnation in Christ. Look in Colossians chapter two. What does five ten say? No, that's not it. It has to do with being no condemnation to the Christian. And so I'm not going to spend the whole rest of the hour looking for it. Although I am tempted to. So uh, look with me please in uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, not only is there no condemnation, but you're complete in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, and ye are complete in Him. Are you in Christ? There it is again. If you're in Him, you know what that means? You're complete. It's done. The Lord completed it. Which is the head of all principality and power. Who? The Him. Jesus Christ. In whom also you are circumcised. Thank God it's not physical. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. It's not physical. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead... In your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So what does that mean? It means the Lord did it all. He did it all for you when he saved you. He fixed you all up. When He made you that new creature in Christ, He just fixed the whole thing. And you're complete in Him. That's your standing now in Christ. Look over there in Hebrews chapter 10. And what we're needing to see and understand in all this is there's a difference between a Christian's standing and a Christian's state. See? And understanding that will help you not get messed up in your Bible like so many Christians do. It will help you see the difference between losing rewards and losing your salvation. Okay? Uh, there in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. Referencing Christ, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Your standing in Christ is that you've been made perfect forever. Oh, what do you just think you're perfect or something? Well, yes, I am. Let me show you. Show them the verse. They'll love that, huh? Witness to somebody? Did they ever say that? You can tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm not, but the new man in me is. And you can be perfect too. You want to be? Well, no. If, if, if I admitted that, I'd admit that I'm not perfect. That's why. That's the, that's the problem. Alright, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. 
There's no condemnation. We're complete in Him. We've been perfected forever. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Death. It's death. Jesus Christ up on that cross, see, that's the curse of the law. Only one problem, Jesus Christ had never broken the law. So it couldn't hold him. He pulled a fast one on him. And got over on the law, see. And we're redeemed from the curse of the law through that. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Here's Jesus on the cross. What is it? It's a curse. You get some baseball player up there, you know, and he gets the dirt on the plate and puts his bat down and then he does one of these. You know what he just did? The cross is a curse. These people with crosses up everywhere and all that stuff. What's all that about? It's a curse. Hey, that thing's a curse. We don't we don't celebrate that thing and have crosses up everywhere. It's, it's a curse. Now I'm not saying that you can't have, you know, a cross for something or whatever. If it represents, if it reminds you of the Lord and all that. I'm not saying that. Just remember what the the that cross to God. That's a curse. See. And that's the the end of the law for us. Thank God, we're redeemed. We're redeemed. Yeah, right. Exactly. He's not there. He's not here. He's risen. Amen. Redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look in Second Corinthians, right before Galatians, chapter one. There's no condemnation. We're complete in Him. We're perfected forever. We're redeemed from the curse of the law, and we're fully delivered. Look in Second Corinthians, chapter one. I mean fully delivered. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Yeah, that's the ministry of condemnation. Well, I know that's, it's referenced in the Old Testament. Right. Because that's all the Old Testament could do was condemn. And Christ didn't come to condemn. He came to save. All right, uh, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust He will yet deliver us. What kind of deliverance is that? That's complete, full deliverance. Past, present, future. See, that's the kind of salvation you got. Jesus Christ saved you. Jesus Christ is saving you Jesus Christ will save you. Jesus Christ redeemed you. Jesus Christ is redeeming you. Jesus Christ will redeem you. Okay? It's, all, it's all in one. I am he that was uh, alive and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Past, present, future. Oh, you get all three in that thing. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. We're redeemed from the curse of the law and we're fully delivered. And we've made we've been made holy. Holy, the blameless children of God. Ephesians chapter one and look in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's what we ought to be interested in is the spiritual blessings, not so much the physical. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. That's what He chose before the foundation of the world. He didn't choose us. He chose that if we got in Him that He would make us holy and without blame before Him. Now, that's something. It's one thing to be able to look at your neighbor and say, I'm holy and blameless. And be able to say, well, I know I'm better than that schmuck. 
See? It's another thing, listen, it's another thing when God looks at you and says, you're holy. <laughs> that's, that's what He did for you. Because if He didn't, you couldn't get into heaven. That's, that's what does it. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Why? Well, you, I, I want you in my family. Why? Because you're holy. See, he predetermined that if you came to Christ, he'd make you holy and he'd make you his child. If you came to Christ. It's already predetermined that he's going to give you those things. He's going to make those things happen in your life having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. See? We're accepted in God. Why? He made us holy. He made us His children. He determined that... He said, listen, if you'll come to My Son and receive Him as your Savior, I'll do all this for you. And that's what He did. Amen. Uh, you have that in Jesus Christ. These are things that you can never lose, that will never change, that can never be taken away. See, you, You've been made a blameless, holy Son of God. Look in verse 6. We've been made acceptable in His sight. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Uh, God accepts you now. You're, you're as good as Him. <laughs> you're as good as God. As far as God's concerned. Yeah, amen, brother. But, I mean, that's salvation. Now, that's what the Lord did for you. He made you as good as God. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty good when He can make you as good as God. And if He didn't do it, it would have never happened. He did it. That's why it's our standing. That's why it's something we know is good and can, you can count on and it ain't going to never change. Because you didn't do it. God did it for you. That's salvation. It's good to be saved. Verse 11. Look in verse 11. Uh, he's also determined something else. Uh, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. That's past tense. Being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. You know why we've already been given that inheritance? Because God predetermined it. Because God wanted to. It's the counsel of His own good will. God's willing to say, all right, you receive Jesus Christ. I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to make you my child. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to build you a mansion. It's going to be up there for you and I'm going to give it to you. You ready for it? You got it. Boom. You. God did that for you. For you. <laughs> For me, uh, verse 13, verse 13, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, that's good news, isn't it? In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, what have we been promised? We've been promised a Future redemption, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So God has promised us He's going to come and, and take us home. He's going to come and redeem us fully one day. Uh, that We have our standing that's in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. i got to get a drink before I start that. You hath he quickened, who were dead, no good, dried up worms, worthy of hell fire for all eternity. <laughs> you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past, think about it, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. 
I'd be in hell right now burning. But God, who is rich, <laughs> who is rich, and of all the riches, I'm glad He's rich in mercy. He said, i got plenty to go around. Who wants some? Who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and gave us a choice to sit together, no, and made us. We didn't have a choice in the matter. Sit down. <laughs> made us sit together. It's, it's hard to get Christians to do that now. But in heaven, He made us sit together. Made us, so I wonder who we're going to have to sit together with up in heaven. Probably the people we couldn't stand down here. Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where's Christ seated? Then where are you seated? Well, unless they were saved. Oh, well, preacher, there's nobody that's saved that I don't like. Uh, that in the ages to come you might show the exceeding riches of His grace. In His kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what the Lord did when you got saved? He put you in heaven. You're already there. See? Mm-hmm. If you've been fretting or thinking about quitting or fading by the way, well, you've already passed from death to life. Brother, you might as well stay. The battle's fought. The victory's won. It's finished, my Lord cried. It made us more than conquerors. Oh, we're living on the other side. I'm already over on the other side. I'm waiting on my brand new body. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fair at the right side of the Father. My citizenship's in heaven. I'm living in Christ, you see. I'm already there in Jesus. Just waiting on my body to be. <laughs> oh, Brother Rex sings that one. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We are now part of the family of God. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That was a thing for me, man. Hard for me when I when it came to getting saved because I knew Christians. And I, for me personally, I was just like, I'm just not good enough to be a Christian. I could never be a Christian. It's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm too bad of a person to ever be a Christian. That's the way I looked at it. That's, that's the thing that kind of kept me back there. Uh, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And uh, I'm glad to be your fellow citizen. Glad to be in the same household with you. Uh, and it's good to know that Lord will take somebody like me because I know He'll take anybody. It will take me. Verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth on holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And what the Lord did is He simply put you into the family of God. And you're there for good now. That's, that's your standing in Christ. Those things are fixed. They've been predetermined by God that if you get saved, you're going to get all that and more. I didn't touch everything. No way you could. We'd be here for weeks. <laughs> What we'd have to do is start in Romans and just keep on going all the way through to, you know, Jude. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get. Well, we're, we're taking care of that little by little here and there. But, Amen. All right, now we've looked at the Christian standing. 
Now let's look at the Christian state. Uh, your state can change. Your state is not predetermined by God. Your state is determined by you. This, is, this part's your choice. Your state. You're standing. You understand that's done. That's good. You've got that. That's done. That's wonderful. Thank God for it. But it ought to, see, it ought to do something in you where you're going to want to take all that that you know and allow it to somehow come out in your life. Now, look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we looked at this in our 1 Corinthians study, so we don't need to get into it in depth, I don't think. But just as a reminder, 1 Corinthians 5 and Romans 7... Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. I'm not talking about the people you work with and the, you know, the, the sinners of this world. You know, you gotta be, you're going to have to you know, run into them and be around them. What I'm talking about is, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to company of any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one no not to eat. Are you to fellowship with Christians that are living in open sin? No. No. You know what that means? No, it means that Christians can live in open sin. It means that just because you're saved doesn't mean you're sinless. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you can't do anything that a lost person can do. They just had, the, I guess, the head of the evangelical church there, Colorado, Colorado or whatever for three years been paying money to a male prostitute. And this is the guy that's supposedly leading the charge for same-sex marriage or against same-sex marriage. Well, that's going to really help their cause, isn't it? God help us. Yes, sir. It's going to hurt. It's, it's hurting God. See? It's hurting God. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is, is, man, you got something like that and a problem like that going on and here you are out there championing the cause of Man, get out of the way and let somebody else do it. If you can't control yourself for crying out loud. And that's the problem, isn't it? It's just people just character and just being able to say no. You know? I mean, I hate to make it, you know, sound like, you know, just say no and all that. But man, when it comes to your flesh, that's it. Yeah, put it off. Put off the flesh. Uh, don't, don't yield to it. And if it's that bad where you've got those kind of problems, man, you don't need to be in a position of leadership in the church. Good night. You need to be in counseling or something, but you don't need to be in no position of leadership. Uh, look back there in uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. The, the whole idea is you have to realize how wicked your flesh is and what it's capable of. Paul said, we are they that put no confidence in the flesh. Now, that's Paul. Philippians 3, what did he say? Hey, if any man could have confidence in the flesh, I could. I was raised up a Pharisee. I was raised under the law. I was raised to do right. I never had a lot of the problems that some of you all have. And I've lived straight as an arrow and as clean as a hound's tooth and never drank anything stronger than buttermilk. And, and Paul could say all that and be that clean. And yet he said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Amen. And it's understanding that. See, That doesn't mean you need to... You don't need to... Um, you don't need to swim in a septic tank to know it's filthy. Young people. 
see. Uh, you see people that have lived filthy lives and God saved them and pull them out of the, some of that stuff, that's good. But don't you think, well, they got away with it, I can. Because they might not have known what you know. You need to stay clean. You need to live right. But you need to realize your flesh ain't no better than that dude that's sitting over there uh, in, the, in the, some reclamation uh, facility somewhere or uh, downtown in some mission somewhere or uh, some... Uh, AIDS ward somewhere or something else. Your flesh ain't no better. And God doesn't look at it as any better. God said, you take that oil and you put it on the priest, uh, but don't get it on the flesh. That flesh is no good. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. The best of flesh is no good to God. So you need to identify the flesh. Know what it's about. Know what it's capable of. Romans 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Anybody say amen there? Amen. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You don't want to do that. If you're a Christian, you don't want to sin. Do you? Not if you're a Christian. There's no Christian that wants to sin. I don't believe that. The question is, is, is how, how strong are you to be able to say no to the flesh when it says yes? When the temptation comes. Verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Do you know that? Paul said he knew it. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would not... Uh, I'm sorry. For the good which I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. You've got to realize you've got flesh and you've got to fight and you've got to battle. And you're going to have it until you go to heaven. And young people, the best things you can do, listen, the best thing you can do, you know the best way to quit smoking? Never smoke. You know the best way to quit drinking? Never drink. You know the best way to quit any addiction? Never get addicted. Never start. If you never start, you'll never get stuck. See? And you won't have those battles and those things to fight with like some of the older people in the church have to fight with. See? And you don't want that. Uh, it, it holds you back from being all you can be for the Lord. You all listening? All right? So, remember that. Live right, stay right, stay clean. Desire it. You ought to be like John Wesley. You know how John Wesley became such a powerful preacher? When he was a boy. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. He was finding other boys in churches and stuff and they started the Holy Club. Other kids are doing all kinds of clubs, hunting clubs and all kinds of other clubs. You know what they did? They started the Holy Club. And they'd get together and pray and talk to each other about how they could live holier lives and would challenge each other. That's good. That'd be a good, that'd be a good club for some kids to be involved in. Maybe we'll start one of those. About the only ones that could be in it is the kids. Is that right? Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 12. I mean, when, when they could get to the point where they could say, I will never ever again disobey my parents once. I will never ever say one bad word ever. See, they'd make pacts on those things. They'd make agreements on that with each other. It wasn't their mom and dad making them do that. They wanted to do it because they loved the Lord and wanted to do right and wanted to live clean. 
Hebrews chapter 12. Now, when you don't do right, you still got a father. He's still going to be your father. You know what he's going to do when you don't do right? Young people, what happens when you don't do right? You get in trouble? That, see, that's it. That, let's face it. They don't say, I get chastised. They don't say, I get beaten, although they may. Or I get the rod, and they may. You know, I get the switch, all that. You know what they say? I get in trouble. You know what happens, Christian? When you don't do right, you get in trouble. You know where most of our troubles come from? <laughs> yeah. Amen. Tribulation. Yeah. Now, some troubles are from the devil and others, and, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, but we, we could probably do with a few less. So live right and do right, and you'll have a lot less troubles. I guarantee it. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That every, you know what that means in the Greek? Every what? So I guess the women don't get chastised. Unless you're also sons. Every son whom he receiveth. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. If you endure chastening, that's an if. See, what happens? When God brings troubles, you haven't been doing right, and then you quit and get mad at God and get out of church, and it happens to a lot of Christians. God starts dealing with them, and they, they get an attitude. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So we all know what we're talking about here, right? If you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. Unless you've been saved for a week, you know what I'm talking about. Verse 8, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Well, thank God. Good that you've been chastised. It gives you faith that you know you're saved and going to heaven. <laughs> Isn't that good? Uh, verse 8, But if you be without chastisement, aware of all partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits to live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after our own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Why is God chastening you? Why is God dealing with you? Because He wants you to do it right. He wants you to be a partaker of His holiness. He wants you to learn what it means to live a holy life. That's God's will for you. God's will for you is to live sinless. But the Bible just said that, you know, we have flesh. I know. But God's will for you is to live sinless. You're His child, He's your Father. He expects perfection. <laughs> he does. All right, you tell me what sin he wants you to commit tonight. Show me in the Bible where he said he wanted you to sin. Okay, we better move on. It's getting real quiet. Verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Well, you take that old fruit tree and you clip off a few branches and chew that thing down a little bit. I'm sure that tree don't mind that. But you know what? The next year it comes back stronger and bear more fruit than it would have if you'd just been left alone. It'll grow straighter if you stay on it and keep training it and directing its growth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 
Are you all praying uh, about a message for this Sunday? I guess not. All right, first. Nobody said yes. I guess you're not. Are you all praying, God, give me a message for this Sunday? No, I don't. No. No, be praying, Lord, give me a message for this Sunday. I mean, I got some messages I can preach. But I'm praying that God will give me a message for this Sunday. All right? Amen. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. God wants us different from the world. God wants us separated from the world. We're His children. We're special to Him over everybody else. He ain't going to chasten the world. He's going to chasten us. Because He wants us to be different. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be pure and clean. Not like the rest of the world. So you can't look at the rest of the world and say, well, why do they get away with that stuff and I don't get to do that? Because you're a Christian. And God's your Father and He's going to deal with you and chasten you. He expects you to do right. Just like if you're here and you've got Christian parents, your parents aren't going to let you do things that parents that aren't saved or don't love the Lord let their kids do. And it's going to be real easy for that pride and that rebellion to rise up in you and say, well, how come they get to do that and we don't get to do it? Because your parents love you and they, they want you to do right and live holy and most of them parents of them kids don't. And you ought to thank God you got parents like that. Amen. That's good preaching. I know good preaching when I hear it. And that's good preaching. <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 12. Now, this, see, we're talking about our state. See, The idea is, is we're to let Christ transform us. Now, when we get saved, how long does it take us to become a new creature in Christ? Well, it's done, right? But that's our standing. That's the inward part. Now, what the Lord wants is the outward to transform, to change into that new creature as well. See, That's God's expectations for His children. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There that is again, that thing with the mind. See, that's where it starts. It starts there. When you make up your mind to do right. Uh, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, you start out finding the good will of God. Then you move on to the acceptable will of God. And then you're supposed to seek the perfect will of God. Amen. And uh, God has one for your life. And the successful person is the person that finds out what God wants them to do and does it. You want to be a success? That's being a success. Find out what God wants you to do and do it. Boom. Uh, look there in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. So God's desire is to transform us. And we read all that in Romans 8 about the fact that there's no condemnation. Amen? But now, because of that, there's some expectations. Verse 12 of Romans 8. Therefore, see, therefore, since there's no condemnation, since God's done all this for you, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. What does that mean? Well, God's going to kill you if you... No, no. Listen, you live after the Spirit, you're going to die in your body. <laughs> you're going to die either way, right? The death there has to do with your fellowship with the Lord. That thing will die. See? 
uh, it's not, you don't have real, you're not living in that sense. You're not abiding with Christ. You're not in fellowship with Him. You live after the flesh. You can't live after the flesh and walk in fellowship with Jesus Christ. You cannot do it. You can't live after the flesh and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. You cannot do it. See? Uh, and you, you, you are a debtor. Or do you, or what do you owe the flesh? How much has it helped you out in your life? Now, who do we owe something to? To the Lord, maybe? All right, so that's who we need to live for, not for the flesh. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. How are you going to mortify the deeds of the body? Through the Spirit. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so the idea is, is that Spirit of life in us, now we have a new life. We just make up our minds. We want to live a new life in Christ and please Him. See? That doesn't mean that you're not going to, you know, have some trip-ups along the way and everything else. But man, you keep going on and you keep that right attitude and you keep that desire that you want to live a life for God and please Him. That's where the blessings are. That's, that's God's desire for you. Uh, but it's up to you. You understand? It's determined by you. Now, God told you what He wants. But see, the one thing that God didn't change when you got saved is He still let you have free will. He hasn't changed that. He says, now that I've done all that for you, I would like it if you would live for me. But you don't have to. You still have free will. But if you don't, we're looking at what's going to happen. You're not going to lose your salvation. I'm not going to hold that over your head like a lot of preachers do. You did that. You couldn't be saved and have done that. You're going to... No. Listen, we already read about that. You can do anything and go to heaven. Be saved and do anything, right? But the whole thing is, is you don't hold eternal life over somebody's head as far as doing right. But you know what you can lose? Rewards. You know what you can lose? Your health. You know what you can lose? Uh, your, your status. You know what you can lose? The way that others think about you. You know what you can lose? Your family. You know what you can lose? Your health. You know what you can lose? Your money. You know what you can lose? Your sanity. You can't lose your salvation, but there's plenty to lose. Plenty. You know what you can lose? Your joy. You know what you can lose? The blessings. You know what you can lose? The presence of God in your life. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. There's a lot to lose. Now, I'm not going to hold over your head and say you're going to lose your salvation. No, that's not Bible. You understand? But the Bible does talk about a lot of things you can lose. I want to see God bless you. There's a lot to get living for God, and it's worth it. I ain't never found anybody that's lived a life for God that's regretted it. Never. I just I've never found that person. You find him, you let me know. I haven't run, in, I haven't run into him yet. Look in uh, Philippians two. We need to finish up Philippians two. So we'll go through these verses real quick. Philippians two and verse twelve. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only. I like that. A lot of people, they can live the Christian life when the preacher's around. <laughs> you know? Uh, or, or when mom or dad are around. Or when the wife's around. Uh-oh. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. used to say, uh, character is what you are when nobody else is around. Uh, and the, the idea here is you're going to work out your own salvation. What? All this stuff we've been looking at, you're standing in Christ? No, yet, no condemnation, complete in Him, perfected forever, redeemed from the curse of the law, fully delivered, You've been made holy, blameless, children of God. You're acceptable in the Beloved. You've been predetermined to an inheritance. You have future redemption promised you. You're already in heaven with Christ. You're now part of the family of God. Well, let's see it. Work it out. 
Allow those things to become real in your life. And uh, when you do that, that's how you grow, see. Now, who doesn't know that? You know, these bodybuilders, how do they pump up? How do they build up? They work out. All right, work out your own salvation, your spiritual muscles. See, you got to work out. You got to work it out to get it where it's in there, isn't it? Yeah, everybody has muscles. Just a lot of people hide them well. But they're there. You just got to work them out. When you work them out, that which is in there can be seen better by others. That's the idea. So you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You know what God wants? He wants you to do His will. He wants you to live a life pleasing to Him. He wants you to desire to please God. Do you desire to? He wants you to. That's what He wants. Alright, so what are you going to do? You have to yield yourself to God. Romans 6. Oh, we've got to hurry. It's 9 now. Romans 6 and verse 11. Y'all maybe get on this no women in heaven stuff and it changed our time clock here. <laughs> Romans, Romans 6 and verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Well, it's already it's, yeah, it's in the past. You used to be a sinner. You used to like to sin. You don't anymore, right? That's it. What is that? That's here. Make up your mind. Make up your mind that you don't want to live in sin anymore. Make up your mind. You don't want to seek the pleasures of sin anymore. Make up your mind. You, you're never going to sin again. Yeah. That's just it. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't do it that way. You've got to make up your mind. You make up your mind, you'll get somewhere. Uh, Romans 6 and verse... 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither you yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. See? You're living now with Christ. You're resurrected. So live for Him. Why do you want to go and join all those dead things again? You live after the flesh, you shall die. See? Members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see that? Yeah, and it's up to you to decide who you're going to obey. You're going to obey the flesh or you're going to obey God. It's just simple as that. And so you've got to make up your mind to do right and that you're going to obey God and seek Him. And, and when you mess up, you're going to get right about it. Uh, verse 19, I speak after the matter of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded yourselves, uh, your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so, now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Right? All right. Now, one idiot. Now be the servant of Christ and be, free, and be free from sin. See? That's what he's saying. What fruit had you then in those things of where you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is what? Death. You live after the flesh, you shall die. See? But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and to the end everlasting life. Amen. So our fruit should be unto holiness. Uh, our desires should be pure. Uh, we just want to please God. We want to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Because we don't want to reap those things, and we, we want to be a testimony for our Savior. Amen. Uh, look there in Ephesians chapter 4. Why? Because we owe Him something. We owe a debt, not to the flesh, but to Him. Let's finish up Ephesians 4 and verse 17. 
This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto the lasciviousness to work all in cleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ if you have been heard of Him and been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And yet you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's what we need to do. Amen? Yield yourselves to God. Yield yourselves to Him. Do right. Colossians 3 and verse 5. Colossians 3 and verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which were upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and a covetousness which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in which you also walked in, uh, some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Why not to one or another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Put on the new man. Yield to the new man, not to the old. Let the new man now begin the reign in your life. How do you do it? Just make up your mind. Renew your mind. Settle it in your mind. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. First John chapter one. First John chapter one. Now, Christians can sin. And when you do, there is a remedy. And thank God. First John chapter one and verse four. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no uh, darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, well, anybody can say it. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins to the priest, he, no, no, we confess our sins to Jesus Christ. Well, why wouldn't you want to do that? Well, I guess if you weren't in fellowship with Him, you wouldn't think you could. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. You need to confess it, get it right, ask God to give you victory. Amen. Repent. Turn from it. Trust the Lord. Walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. And make no provision for the flesh. Don't give opportunity. You know what I mean? I mean, you can make sure that there's certain things you can do to prevent opportunities. There's certain verses you can memorize to help you. I mean, do your part. Don't, don't expect God to do everything. You know when some of you are going to quit some of the things you've been having trouble with? When you make up your mind you want to quit. <laughs> uh, chapter 3. And you keep waiting on God to do something. And he's just waiting on you. First John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever, you know, it's not as quiet now in the state as it was in the standing. I noticed that. It's a little... First John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in Him, are you in Christ? Is no sin. Whosoever abideth in Him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither known Him. Now, you understand the difference. In John chapter 1, we're talking about our state. As a Christian, you can sin. And if you do, you need to confess it. And get it right with the Lord. But as a Christian, in John chapter 3, He's talking about your standing. You cannot commit sin. 
You can't break the law. You're perfect. You're sinless in God's eyes. That's why you go to heaven. You understand the difference between your standing and your state? Now, what God wants us to do is line up our state with our standing. Our standing, we're sinless, right? And what God wants us to do is try to work out that state part where it gets lined up with standing. That's what we desire. If you're saved, it's in you. You desire that. You want that. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Amen. So you can't sin, but you need to confess your sins. Now you know why people have trouble understanding the Bible. Because the Bible says as a Christian you can sin. And the Bible says as a Christian you can't sin. But it's understanding the difference between your state and your standing. See? Your standing in Christ is you're completely perfect, holy, sinless, undefiled, perfected, in heaven already with Christ. But your state can be, you know, an altered state. The, the state of confusion. God forbid the state of Massachusetts. It can be anything. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 16. 1 John 5, 16. If any man... Now, see, this is what gets a lot of them messed up right here. A lot of Christians get messed up in these verses right here. A lot of them. Verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for Oh, the unpardonable sin. and Oh, he committed the unpardonable sin and now he's damned. Listen, if there was one unpardonable sin, then that means there's something you can do to earn your salvation, Christian. You got it? There's no such thing. The unpardonable sin in the day and age we live in is rejecting Jesus Christ. Because when you stand before God after rejecting His Son, there is no other pardon available. That's the unpardonable sin. Any sin is pardonable if you'll come to Christ. So that's not what this is talking about. Now, how many of you know what this is talking about? Nobody raised their hands, all right? Verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. All right, so unrighteousness is a sin not unto death. Would you agree? Is that what he just said? Okay, look back in chapter 1. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all... What? Alright. So, there's a way out of unrighteousness. That's a sin not unto death. See? What is that? What's unrighteousness? Anybody know? Not doing right. As Christians, can we not do right? As Christians, can we break the law? No. No. We cannot... What is, what is breaking the law? Committing sin. Can we commit sin? No, but we can do wrong. See? We can do unrighteous, but we can't commit sin. You got it. Alright. Now, look at it again. Verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. If you commit sin, there's a sinner unto death. It only takes one. How many sins does a lost person have to commit to go to hell? One. Is Jesus Christ praying for that person? Look back there in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You got somebody praying for you? All right. You got somebody praying for you. That's the difference. Does a lost person have anybody praying for them? You know what he's doing here in chapter 5? He's wrapping up the book. 
He's, ex- he's, ex- he's concluding everything he's talked about. So you, you can't understand and, and, and interpret chapter 5 without knowing the first four and a half chapters. See? Here in chapter 5, look there again now. All right. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he, who's the he? What? Your brother? Well, who is it? Which? Huh? The one who sees it? Well, we got a problem. Some are saying one thing. and so, You see, that's the problem. You get into this, he, well, who's that? Right? Well, let's, let's try it this way. Verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in him. All right, who's the him there? Jesus Christ. That if we ask anything according to His will, who's the His? All right. He heareth us. Who's the He? Okay. And if we know that He heareth us, who's the He? Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the positions that we desire to Him. Who's the Him? If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, who's the He? You see? You go by the context. He shall ask. And He shall give Him life for them who... A brother. A Christian. Why? Chapter 2, you have an advocate with the Father. you got somebody praying for you. you got somebody standing in your place up there in heaven before the Father. Continually. See? It's a continual salvation. If any man see his brother sin a sin, well, if his brother sins a sin, it's not unto death. Because he's a Christian. He can't commit sin. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he, Jesus Christ, shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. In other words, the reason that we don't lose our salvation is because of Jesus Christ. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. What's that? Any lost person when they sin, because they don't have Jesus Christ interceding for them. Uh, look in verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Can we do that which is not right? But it's not a sin unto death. Why? We can't commit sin. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You understand, once you get this standing in state thing down, your Bible will begin to make a little more sense to you. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, in the sense of what? You cannot commit sin. But you already, he already told you to confess your sins when you sin. You see? So you're confessing your sins in reference to your state. But in reference to your standing, which is what he's talking about here, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of, uh, of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding. Well, he just did it tonight, didn't he? That we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his Son. Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. It's good to be in Christ. Thank God for our standing in Christ. But let's do our best to get that state transformed, worked out, to line up with our standing. Amen? Alright, sorry to keep you a little long tonight. I'll, uh, I'll make up for it by uh, giving you off next Friday. <laughs> I'll be with you in spirit, brother. Uh, so, no Bible study next Friday, and then, Lord willing, the Friday after that, we'll pick it back up. All right, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Brother Mick, would you close us in prayer, please?